Because when is this movie coming out? Or the sorry, Dawson's oh, yeah. series. I don't know. No? Uh, we're pitching it around now. But yeah, maybe it, it'll be quite a while. It, it seems that these things take forever and we have to finish the series too. So it, yeah. it turned into a series. So it'll be a while. It's really exciting because, um, I mean, I just found you, I think, on Instagram. And I, people should definitely follow your Instagram, Food Lies. It's amazing. You post the coolest stuff. It's the most informative. But also it's like so interesting and funny. Um, great stuff on there. And so you've been uh, doing research for this docuseries for like, what, six years? Yeah, over six years now. Yeah. So you must know a lot. I mean, I people say I do my research, but six years is like, I mean, you must know everything about food at this point. Well, there's always something new to learn, but I have come to some good conclusions over the years and learned a lot and kind of relearn things and zoomed out a bit and you know like thought that i knew a lot and then realized i don't and then i learned more and then you keep zooming out until you can't really debunk yourself so i think it's it's best to try to do that actually is try to debunk yourself yeah i like that i heard you say that 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 is what science is about is that you think of some a theory and then you try to disprove yourself you try to debunk the, your own theory not the other way around, which is what we're now science is turning into is like, hey, we think this and we're going to try to prove it and prove you wrong and spend a bunch of money to prove that we're right. Exactly. Yeah, that's how science is done. The the nutrition science, a lot of stuff is done that way. Also, that's what how the vegetarian stuff goes. So people might have seen the Blue Zones. There's a new documentary on Netflix or a little docuseries. And it's exactly what happened is a guy named Dan Buettner for, I don't know, 20 years now, more, has been just trying to prove that we should be vegetarian without any actual science. He's just kind of going around because this was his preconceived notion that we should be vegetarian just based on his personal beliefs. And then he go, went around and tried to reverse engineer that. And <laughs> so I actually, yeah, uh, there's a, yeah. a lot of good people debunking him though. It's great. Well, yeah. And you have that film on your YouTube channel that people can watch for free game changers debunked. There's two there. I guess there's two versions, one, just the regular. And then one with the deleted scenes. I watched the deleted scenes. I thought the deleted scenes were hilarious. Personally, <laughs> we tried to have fun with it. It was Dr. Sean Baker's idea. He's hilarious, you know, big meat eating guy. And he just wanted to do some skits. Yeah. So explain, I know you've told the story a million times, but just the whole background, you know, you started mechanical engineering and then you turned 30 and some things happened to your parents. Can you explain that whole thing to my audience? Why you got interested in this topic? Yeah. Yeah. 30. I lost both my parents at 30 and it, it was kind of a wake up call. And it was a, it was actually really at the same time that I started getting the dad bod and kind of going downhill with my health. A lot of times that happens at 30 and really what happens at 30 is a lot of people just can't get away with the modern diet and lifestyle. So that's really what happens is that you kind of get away with it while you're young and then it catches up to you. And so you have to make some changes. And I just started eating properly and my whole life changed. It was so, it was so easy. Like I just stopped eating like bread and pasta and seed oils and stuff. And it just happened naturally. And I, I just went to more natural human diet, which, you know, we can explore later, but uh, I had chronic conditions myself. I had uh, all these overuse injuries and inflammation in my arms and wrists and body from using the computer. I had um, acid reflux. I had joint pain. I had uh, really just extra 25 pounds of fat all around my body. And then I lost all that when I just made a few simple changes to my diet. And I thought, well, I just need to tell the world about this. So I, yeah, I quit my job and just started doing this full time. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I, the before and after pictures, are pretty spectacular. So did you, is the before and after, is that strictly from diet or did you change a workout thing too? Well, I work out less now. So oh. yeah, uh, I used to, I'm not a big fan of jogging. I think there, I mean, if any exercise people do is good, but I was just tr trying to outrun my bad diet back in the day. And I, I just think this steady state cardio, you people sitting on a treadmill for 45 minutes, isn't really helping anyone. Hmm. And you need to change your diet first. And that's most important. And then also I just changed 
instead of doing that, I started sprinting for very short times instead, or lifting weights, like very, I do this quick and efficient workout that's only 30 minutes twice a week. So I've never spent more than an hour in the gym in a week in, ever. Like what the hell I'm, I'm working out six or seven days a week and uh, I don't look like you. Like maybe I need to switch to your workout or your, uh, I anything. do teach it. Yeah. yeah the, I, I, it's a whole thing. I learned through all my interviews in the last six years, I interviewed muscle protein researchers, you know, exercise scientists, all this type of stuff and kind of found the most efficient way to, to work out. Wow. Okay. We'll have to explore that. But yeah. So, I mean, the basic thing is uh, this is, this applies to literally everyone, especially in America. I mean, we're, we're going through a health epidemic. There's so much chronic disease and I'm the same as you. I had the acid reflux. I don't, uh, have it anymore unless I start eating crappy again. But you know, but it's interesting. I think the li- it hasn't the life expectancy in the U.S. actually gone down for the first time in like oh yeah, oh it's mainly the U.S. So it's gone up. You know, so as we got better nutrition and we got better medicine, it's gone up in the last hundred years, and then finally in the last four years, about it's gone down, and way worse than other nations too. If you look at these graphs, like U.S. is is tanking, and some other countries that are, you know, I guess eating better than us, doing some other things better than us, it's it's doing fine. So I think there's a lot going on here, but I really think that the foundation is food and what what we eat and that's kind of what we're proving in the food lies series is that food matters most. Cuz a lot of people will blame it on other things, right? They'll say, "Oh, it's just genetics." Mm-hmm. Like, well, our morta- our uh, rates of death are going crazy right now, right? Our life expectancy is shortening. So why, why that's our genetics didn't change in the last four years. But so like in 1860, the average lifespan was 39. And then in 2020, it was like 78. So it has increased a lot in that time, but now it's going, we're going backwards. So, but what has changed? Cause I know like, um, you know, I I think at one point, like people didn't have all this chronic disease, like and, and now it says, like, people say that every, all these older people, everyone's on all these medications, which I guess, you know, some of these things can keep you alive. But then what kind of life do you have? I mean, it's like you said, was it your mom or dad that had Alzheimer's? And um, my mom, yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, I feel like there's all this. And every, how many people have diabetes or pre diabetes and all these other things? Is there a way? I mean, and you're saying that through diet and exercise, we can avoid a lot of these chronic diseases. Yeah. So, Back in the day, we would die of different things. There, there was, we would die of malnutrition things. We'd die of infectious diseases. We'd, we'd die of things that we we couldn't prevent until recently. And now we're just dying of chronic diseases, which are really accepted. You know, at least mainstream accepts that it's something to do with diet and lifestyle. Most of people accept that. And so, yeah, back in the day, it used to be very rare to die of of some of these cancers or Alzheimer's, we didn't really have it. Like we didn't really have the names for some of these things. And so it really all came in with the invention of all the processed foods. And everyone likes to, you know, blame it on one thing or another. But if you look hard enough, you know, some people even say, oh, well, we're using iPads now and everyone's just sedentary. And I say, yes, it's it's not good to be sedentary. Of course, you want to do some sort of exercise, but that is not causing this massive disease and early death, right? You can kind of rule out all of the other things and what you're left with is diet. Yeah. Okay. So like, let's let's talk about the things that I think most people will agree on Um, avoiding, you know, drugs like street drugs, avoiding Mm -hmm. smoking, uh, you know, trying to get about eight hours of sleep, doing some kind of exercise. Uh, Those things are pretty well established, but a diet is such a debate. I mean, it really is because like my doctor told me, uh, Mediterranean diet. What is your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So this is the the nuance here, right? This is why we have to make a six part series is that the the Mediterranean Mediterranean diet is, is fine, you know, and, and what the doctor is using is kind of epidemiology and these, you know, looking at entire countries and trying to make conclusions and you have to do a lot more than that. But in the Mediterranean, people are eating whole foods. They're eating a lot more whole foods. They're preparing their foods. You know, traditionally, they would make meals from scratch. They would be grown locally. They would be seasonal. Um, This would include a lot of fish, a lot of 
just whatever animals, you know, meat they had around them, homemade fruits, vegetables, whatever. And yeah, maybe some pastas and bread. And it, maybe it wasn't so bad if you're raising them without covering them in glyphosate. And, you know, we in, in the U.S., we have a lot more problems with um, how we're raising our crops. And so the Mediterranean diet is a decent diet in my book. You know, I have no problem with that. It's just what is the Mediterranean diet? And a lot of people don't know what it actually is. I, mean, I, I talk to food researchers and sociologists, paleoanthropologists, people that go and, and study this stuff, and they go to the Mediterranean. And the modern Mediterranean diet is not what keeps people healthy, right? It's that they're having their own problems with all these processed foods and different ways of doing things. But the traditional Mediterranean diet is simple meat, eggs, seafood, whole foods, and some like more homemade breads and pastas that weren't really the main dish. It's not like you go to the like Olive Garden and you're getting pounds and pounds of bread and pasta. <laughs> yeah. Like you're getting pounds and pounds of fresh foods and and fish and meat and you know vegetables. And then there's like little side dishes. Right. That's uh, well I had Vinny yeah. Tortorich on. Um I'm not I'm not sure if familiar I know Vinny. Yeah, yeah. I almost yeah. made food lies with him actually. Oh okay. Yeah. He's a cool guy. But he was talking about how when all this stuff first came out because he was a personal trainer and, he, and when he heard like the food pyramid, he's like, all the trainers were like, what the hell? This is totally BS because, and he, he had an interesting point about it, Italian food, um, you know, because usually Italian food was like, you know, giant meatballs and stuff. And then the pot, the, the pasta part was kind of like the side of it, like the garnish almost or whatever. Like, and he said the one that was like, mostly, uh, is it pasta primavera? I can't remember one of them. He's like, that's the, the pasta of the whore is what is what it's called mm. actually. And so <laughs> that was like the low class pasta was the one that was mostly the carbs like the meat stuff the meat heavy pastas were what the rich and the high class people ate in italy i'm sure you, yeah. you probably studied that absolutely yeah. oh absolutely it's basically meat and fish for all of history was a sign of prosperity it was what people strived for it's why they worked daily was to afford the meat to put on the table and this was a centerpiece i mean you just look in even in america in the 1950s look get a photo of a family dinner and there's a beef roast in the middle of the table. So this was always what humans knew as the best nutrition. And then solely the, I don't know, corporate interests came in. There's, there's a lot of profit in selling these processed foods. And I realized that that's how the world works and they can shape the entire society using that high profit margin. So I, I have an example. So I have a company called Nose to Tail. We just do the best regenerative meat, right? Really high quality. Like the ranchers are out there moving the cattle each day. It's just all natural. I make no money on it. It it like you can't make there's no profit margin, right? You, maybe even if we did have enough revenue, there's no profit margin on that revenue, right? Because Why is that? Pay... Wouldn't couldn't you just charge more, but then you won't sell any? Or... Yeah, exactly. No one okay. there's a certain it already is expensive and people mm. won't buy it. There's only so wow. much you can pay for a steak. So there's no profit margin on it. I'm telling you, even if you did raise prices, it's yeah. still you'd go from like 10% profit to like 12% profit margin. Mm. And then you look at cereal or pasta, it's like 90% profit margin. It's in a completely different ball game. That's so crazy. You, this Isn't I it, um, understood how the world works. Yeah. yeah. It's so it's like if you process a bunch of grains, especially that they're subsidized by the government, and it, you have a box of cereal, the box might cost more than the cereal, right? You maybe have three cents of cereal, you have four cents a box. And then you sell it for six dollars. This is gonna give you, and then you times that by a billion. You know, these Kellogg's will sell billions of boxes of cereal per year. Okay, then you can do all of the marketing, right? You blanket children's TV shows with yeah. advertisements for cereal, you blanket the news, everything is just and you blanket, blanket the marketing. government, the food pyramid. That that's totally corrupted, right? Yeah. Remember well, there's the, a whole like, story there. told us, like, you got to eat a lot of bread. It was this Ansel Keys guy who was like, I hear is like a con artist that came up with this study. Yeah. So Ansel Keys. So we go through that story. You know, Vinny made a film that like covered a lot of this. We're kind of just covering it in brief detail because the story has been told. But mm -hmm. yeah, there was this debate in the 50s of what was causing heart disease. And we kind of know what was causing heart disease back then. They smoking? were starting to use all, yeah, they all they had all these fake oils. They're using margarine. They're smoking. People were smoking indoors. They're smoking with their baby in the car with the windows rolled up. It was wild. <laughs> it's a madman, right? 
it was wild. But you're having martinis game. at lunch and stuff. That's probably not good either. I'm guessing. Oh no, no, this is not good. And so they blamed it on fat. And there's a whole story with Ansel Keys kind of fitting data. The same thing, right? He come, he came in with this preconceived idea that it was saturated fat. And so he cherry picked these seven countries out of 22 and made it seem like that saturated fat was a problem, right? But yeah. then when you look at all the data, you find that, that there was no distinct trend line that just showed that the more saturated fat they ate, the more they get heart disease. And th there's much more to the equation. Yeah. Anyway. Well, and explain this to me because it's so funny, even in, in my college nutrition class, this was in the nineties back a long time ago, but they told me that margarine was better than butter and butter was bad. And uh, so I remember like, you know, my parents had that. Do you remember? Like, I can't believe it's not butter. The spray. Yeah. And my parents had that. My parents would fall all this stuff too. And I remember using that. And my sister would be joking, like, that they, they should call it, I can't believe it's not cancer because it's just yeah. all, all these chemicals. And like, looking back, I'm like, oh my God, why, what was I thinking? Like eating that stuff. But that's what like they taught us in nutrition. Yeah. Well, that's what I was saying. There's a lot of money in it. So they can do all the marketing. They can do all the lobbying and they can do all these fake studies. I'm telling you, like once you like really wake up to this you realize that's how the world works is if you have this huge profit margin you have these huge industries based on making billions of dollars per year on selling you this stuff then you can do a lot you can do a lot of lobbying and a lot of influence when just to keep this going oh yeah i just had that um that gif go through my head of like the scarface when they have the money have you seen that one mm -hmm. you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah the money's oh, yeah. coming and they're just laughing with the cigars and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's real though. That's what's what happened with. So explain the seed oils. Um, because the seed oil, it's everywhere. And so I mean, it's in restaurants, not only in the salad dressings, but like how they cook the food. Um, what is the deal with that? Why is that in so many places and, and why is that bad for you? Well, yeah, that's it's the original, it's like the margarine story. So mm -hmm. in the early 1900s, they invented this process to take basically a waste product. It was like a kind of a machine lubricant. They used it for other stuff to cottonseed oil. And they would just like, what can we use this for? And they finally invented this 16 step process that with deodorizes and bleaches and uses like hexane solvents to make this waste product into something edible. And then they had this whole marketing campaign to tell people to use it, that it was like, oh, it's just cleaner than your mom's lard. You know, don't use the natural fat. So they kind of like leveraged this kind of innovation thing. In, in the early 1900s, everything was about, you know, the newest, best appliances and advertising to the, the housewife of like, modernize your kitchen with, you know, Crisco, you know, don't use the, you know, use these great new products. So the margarines and the, the trans fats, at least we figured out those were bad, right? So these are these hydrogenated oils and that were made from the seed oils and at least we figured out that those are bad right so people stopped using them and there's you know some government stepped in and said you can't use these anymore but they would still allow the seed oils right so this is just anything that comes from a seed anything that's not a fruit so the good oils uh well really the good fats are are animal fats anything from an animal fat is natural it's what we've always eaten for all of history we've always eaten animal fats and then when you look at the oils fruit oils are good coconut oil olive oil avocado oil these are three fruits that people have been getting oil from naturally right you don't need the 16 step process you just smash them and you get oil <laughs> yeah and, and it's also a completely different fatty acid composition. So one of the main problems too is the the seed oils are just high in polyunsaturated fats and they can oxidize easily and, and they incorporate into your body. So you don't want this different type of fat incorporated into your cells that we're not used to, right? If you get this high amount of these seed oils that's highly unsaturated, these polyunsaturated, it can oxidize easily and it doesn't it's just not what our cell wants. Right. right. So what are examples of seed oil? Like canola oil? Is that a seed oil? Or yeah, all of that. Canola. We uh wheat, what are I think what is a Chipotle uses like a wheat bran oil or oh, something? They do? There's just anything that's not olive Soybean oil. Soybean oil, is that bad? Soybean oil is terrible. This is what's mainly used. It's one of the cheapest oils. Uh, so they use these in fryers. And what's especially bad is it, these oils that sit in the fryers all day and they're even reused and reused and they're heated and they go up and down. This is just 
getting more and more oxidized and just more and more bad for you. And you, you, they, they stay in your body for years. So really, you know, people say, oh, fried food is bad. And then they just blame fat. I'm like, well, no, fried food is bad because it's using the wrong kind of fat. Mm. And you're, you're frying everything in these unnatural oils. And then, yes, it is bad. This is one of the main things I absolutely avoid. Like, I do not eat fried food that's fried in oil. If I eat any fried food at all, it would be something that someone made by hand fried in beef fat. Wow. Right? Like, or, yeah. So you don't eat any fast food, even like just like a cheat meal or anything like that? No, I don't. I barely eat at restaurants. People think I'm like strict or crazy or extreme, but really just over the past, well, it's been 10 years, six years, just full time. But 10 years, I slowly got just disinterested in restaurant food. You know, and, and it takes, it's a process. I'm not saying people listening are going to, you know, all of a sudden change their entire life and never go to a restaurant again. But I I go to restaurants like once every three months. Hmm. Like, I just don't, I, it just doesn't interest me. I, I can make better food at home. You yeah, know, I've I'm starting not, to get to that point too. I, I, I'm starting to eat more and more at home. And like, I was talking to my girlfriend, we're like, because we travel, we'll do like a road trip and then like, you always like want to have lunch, you know, like on a day trip or something. And I go this weekend, I want to do a day trip, but I want to bring a cooler and I want to bring my own food mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you try to go to a restaurant and you try to eat healthy. And it's just, you're, it's a gamble. You don't, it, you're probably right. They're probably using soybean oil, all this terrible stuff. And it's like, I'd rather just bring my own food. Yeah. It's, it's hard to find good food. I mean, you, we don't have to like go too crazy. You know, if I'm like just traveling, and I really can't eat something. I can find something to order where you can just order, you know, the beef patties or something, and mm -hmm. hopefully they won't cover them in oil. Or you can ask <laughs> them to not cook them in oil, yeah. but you can eat, yeah, you can get simple foods from a restaurant. And yeah, there's ways to do it, but just, yeah. yeah. So what is your diet now? It's like you eat red meat, eggs, mushroom and onions, I saw at one point, and now you're, you've added some veggies, like some sweet potatoes, like low glycemic kind of veggies. Yeah, yeah. So. It's changed over the years, but it's always just around real food and it's around animal foods as the, the base, right? This is the foundation of health. And this is what it's always been for human history, unless we were poor and starving, right? Like you said, it's like, yeah, it, we, everyone has to fill up on bread and pasta now because it's cheap. It's cheap filler. And that's not what we used to do. And uh, so, yeah, I eat any kind of red meats, fish, eggs. I have, yeah, just simple vegetables on the side that I cook or fermented vegetables. And then I have fruit for dessert. I have raw milk. I have cheeses, you know, it's just, it's really like delicious and simple. It's just, you have to kind of not buy into the mainstream idea of what you should be eating. Explain the raw milk thing. Cause doesn't our government say like, don't drink raw milk, you'll die. And then other people say, I hear that raw milk is better than pa pasteurized. Is that the other kind of milk? that? The yeah, yeah. What is the so, difference? Well, pasteurization kills all the good enzymes. It, it, kill, it changes the chemical structure of the milk, actually. You can look at it under microscope. You could probably Google it and find you know, raw milk and pasteurized milk and see the difference. And it has the structure still intact. Uh, it's a completely different substance. It also has all the enzymes still in it. So you need those enzymes to be able to digest the milk. So a lot of people think that they are lactose intolerant, but they aren't. They're just drinking pasteurized milk because 99% of milk, any dairy products you buy is pasteurized, more than 99%. You have to really go out of your way to find raw milk. But so I had problems with dairy too. So I thought, oh, well, I've just, you know, don't do well with dairy and it, it makes me have allergies or it could make, you know, have different reactions. Then I started drinking raw milk and I get absolutely nothing. It's amazing. It's just, you can digest it perfectly well and you feel great. And it's just a great source of nutrients. So what is the, why does, why do they pasteurize it? Is it something to kill bacteria? Like the bat, is there some risk of something bad happening from drinking raw milk? Uh, I mean, there's always a risk, but really, if you look at, at the risk of foodborne illness, it's mainly from vegetables. There, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Okay, we're, if we're trying to feed 8 billion people, there's always things that go bad. Mm -hmm. And most of it is is actually from things like lettuce and leafy greens that, that 
have a lot of stuff that catch on the leaves, right? And that they're still present when you, you buy them at the store and then you can get sick from it. Then there's other, you know, meat can go bad, right? If you don't handle it properly or there could be some bacteria. Everything has a risk, but raw milk, it's funny because it actually, there's like some of the least cases of illness from raw milk. And people will say, oh, partly because they have government regulations now and all that. But it's really, uh, I mean, I can't recommend people <laughs> well drink raw milk. It's it's legal in more than half the states. It's it's just that it what what's okay. This is a good point. What's good? What what helps the masses? What helps government bodies and what helps like big manufacturers usually isn't good for the individual, mm. right? So we have to make decision based on huge populations of 100 million people, 300 million people, right, in the U.S. And so they're just like, well, we it's raw milk is healthier. And I, I'm pretty sure these food scientists at the USDA know this because it's base, it's just common sense and common knowledge that raw milk has the active enzymes that you need to drink it. And this is what we've been eating for all of history. But maybe there was a lawsuit 30 years ago or where someone got sick from the raw milk. So it's better to just regulate it and just say that it has to be pasteurized. And then there's a whole money-making thing too in certifying it and and doing this whole thing. Mm. So it's like, yes, it's it's better to just make these broad sweeping things for the powers that be or for you know things at the top, but that usually is kind of bad for the individual. So there's like kind of a law of nature that I realized over the years is why is everything so bad? Why is a food pyramid upside down and backwards? Well, you just it's just better for the powers that be it's better for the corporate interests it's all the and then they're paying they're doing all the lobbying and it's just easier and more profitable to have these systems that hurt the individual right so what's for individual health i usually do the opposite of what the guidelines are and <laughs> that's that, what i'm hearing from a lot of people that are healthier i you know i try to look to the people that are healthy and say okay what are you doing because you're you're in good health you look good what I want to fo follow your rules and the government, I, I don't think they, what the people that are following those guidelines are usually not healthy. Well, yeah. I mean, that's just a law of nature though. Like how it works. It's like, what's good for the top is usually bad for the bottom, right? It's like, what's good for the CEO of the company mm. is not really great for the janitor. Yeah. It, it's just like how it works. I'm yeah. just telling you that it, it's not like these guys are that evil. They're just trying to get paid and do their sure. thing. And, you know, they justify selling in, in a boardroom to try to, you know, decrease profit and make people healthier or you or can increase profit and make people sicker. Like if you're if you're in the business of making money and you're not in the business of ethics, then I guess that's a good sell for the boardroom. It's exactly it, what's what's what have to happen, what has to happen. They are legally responsible to make profits for the shareholders. Right. These big companies, they cannot just make decisions based on that. That's actually against the law of commerce and right of like yeah. their their entire uh, company would would fall apart and they would get fired. So I actually realized this, how processed foods work. It's actually the opposite incentive. So processed foods are the more they process them and put in things like seed oils, added sugar, refined grains, all these cheap ingredients the less nutrition they have and the more people will overeat them also yeah. with the big flavorings. So no, but this, so it's, it's actually the exact opposite incentive. So they have no incentive to keep people healthy. They, they actually get paid more. They sell more boxes of cereal or whatever it is, packages of snacks, if they put less nutrition in them, because this is how mm -hmm. the human body works. It seeks nutrition. Like we have sensors in our body that detect things like a, a protein, a savory flavor, right? So if you put chips and you put like a fake savory flavor on it and you put no nutrition in it, right? You put no protein, there's no minerals and vitamins, then your body will eat them and it will think that it's getting some protein, maybe because that savory flavor fall of history meant we were getting protein and nutrients, but we don't. So you, your body keeps eating, right? So your body keeps eating these empty foods and you, they have the taglines, once you pop, you can't stop or bet you can't eat just one. And this is true because they found out the less nutrients they put in, the less protein and the less nutrients they have in a food, the more people will eat it. So it's actually exactly opposed to your health. 
Yeah, I saw that. You posted a clip about that with, uh, I think it was Doritos or something. I was like, oh, that is so fascinating. So smart, but so evil at the same time. It's super evil. Yeah, but they just, they're, but I mean, they have no duty to make a health food. It's not yeah. like yeah. They're, they're a weight loss clinic. Yeah, and that's that, true. Right? Like weight loss clinic is incentivized to have you lose weight. Right. Right. That's the whole thing. The fast food, like the chips, Doritos has zero incentive to do anything other than get you to eat more chips. Yeah. Well, so talk about sugar. Cause I can't remember what is the documentary that was it food incorporated or one of them like really focuses on sugar and how they've, uh, how they process that, how cheap it is, how they put it in every freaking food. Like check your food labels. Like it's in like peanut butter and like random things and bread and stuff. We're like, why is there sugar in bread and peanut butter? And I think the biggest thing is soda. And uh, I mean, I, I'm guilty of this too, because I, I love a Coke Zero, vanilla cherry Coke. Oh, it's so good. But mm -hmm. it's so terrible for, especially the, the diet sodas are even worse than the sugary sodas, right? Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have different opinions on that. But I mean, the sugar, part, at least it doesn't have pure sugar in it, mm -hmm. but you could get in trouble with all these fake chemicals and your body is still tricked kind of into thinking that it's sweet. So there could be some bad effects. People say there's bad effects to the gut microbiome from the fake sweeteners. So there's a lot going on there, but, but to the sugar topic. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's the excess of all this, right? Like sugar in itself, like, okay, sweet. Like if you ate fruit back in the day or honey, that wasn't, it's not just poison. It's not like, oh, you just get cancer and you die because you ate some sugar from fruit, right? But if what they found out is it's way cheaper to add it into everything. And yes, you're right. Everything you go, look at your ketchup, it's filled with corn syrup. It's like, you know, could be like 20 grams of sugar. You didn't even know you're getting because it doesn't even taste sweet, really. Ketchup mm -hmm. doesn't really taste that sweet unless you realize, you think about it. You're like, oh, wait, this does taste a little sweet. And then you look at the bottle mm -hmm. and it, so it's like people are getting so much sugar, it's added everywhere, and it's displacing good nutrition. So these are kind of the nuances that people don't really think about that often is that it's not that oh, like sugar is toxic, because you can jump ahead because like, okay, people who have cancer and they're like, oh, there's the sugar, uh, the, the cells are running on sugar, and so you it's causing cancer and this and that, I'm like kind of. Does this make sense? Like, yeah, if you, if you're eating, if your metabolism is messed up, you're eating sugar all day, every day, then this is causing metabolic problems. And it's definitely causing these disease, chronic diseases. But the, the main point is that it's not like sugar is just inherently toxic, right? Because a lot of people, I look at both sides of these arguments. People were like, oh, well, I eat you know, I ate, there's like fruitarians that eat of just pure fruit and, and they eat a lot of quote sugar, but they're very skinny and they're okay. Well, they're, they're malnourished, but uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they don't look great and they have other problems, but mm. still it, it shows that it's the quantities, right? It's the quantities that matter. And so I'm not afraid of eating fruit. I was, so I did go more low carb for a long time. You know, I've tried the different diets. I've done keto. I've done low carb. I've done this stuff. But now I'm eating more fruit and eating sweet potatoes, like you said. You know, I'm eating foods in their whole form. And that's completely different than eating just straight sugar. Yeah. Well, because if you eat an apple, it's sweet and it's got sugar in it, but it's also got fiber. So talk about fiber, because I think that was a little bit of the theory with the food pyramid. And that's what I learned in nutrition classes that fiber is really good for you. You need most Americans are not getting enough fiber. Fiber prevents colon cancer. Fiber can help fight heart disease. And so when you're eating a meat heavy diet, how, how do you get enough fiber or do you need fiber? Is that a myth? Oh, fiber is the longest story. It's such a nuanced thing. It's really? kind of so fiber. There's nothing inherently healthy about fiber. This is a, association. So I'm not saying fiber is bad. Hmm. Stay with me here. So, okay. <laughs> there, the, all that it means is people are eating whole foods. Okay. So this is a lot of nutrition stuff. It, you kind of get lost in, in some of the details mm -hmm. where you don't actually need fiber. It's just that people who eat more fiber are eating less junk. Does this make sense? Like if yeah. you're eating, it's like you were saying before with the, the sugar, how the sugar is displacing the nutrition that you should be getting. 
Yes. So fi so yeah, so fiber in a sense is good, but I don't I don't say that the fiber is magical. I it's just that you it's not like a diet people are lacking fiber. It's that they are filled up on processed foods. And if you're eating more fiber, that means you're eating real foods. So the, so part of the way to prove this is you look at carnivores, right? There's a lot of carnivore diet people out there, yeah. not me. I enjoy me. I eat a lot of meat. I'm friends with all these carnivore people. Mm -hmm. People have been doing it for 20 years. You know, there's there's some of these people that have been doing it, like Sean Baker famously has been doing it for like nine years, 10 years. There's other people doing it for 20 years. There's actually a rancher lady that I'm going to interview that's been doing it for like 50 years. Really? She, she's in her 70s and looks incredible. Wow. Her name is Maggie. Like she, like people don't believe her. I posted about her. Uh, my friend, Dr. Anthony Chafee visited her and saw her driver's license in person and verified her age. I think she might be 80 now. And she looks like she's 40. It's incredible. Wow. And so she's not eating fiber. I'm telling like Inuit, there, there's huge populations of people that don't eat fiber for most of the year, right? And super healthy. You go in the Arctic. I've interviewed some of these people. They just eat reindeer meat and fish and just whatever, right? They don't have fiber. Throughout history, there was, we were in an ice age for tens of thousands of years. We were not eating plants for that time. We were up hunting woolly mammoth and giant bison and stuff. Yeah. So it's it's not necessary. It's good, but it's it's not, I'm saying it's bad. It could be bad for some people. Actually, some people get in trouble with fiber where they uh, get it's like IBS and Crohn's and these different inflammatory diseases because they, they have an autoimmune reaction and it partly could be too much fiber, too much roughage yeah. and it's irritating their gut and they get rid of it and all of their symptoms clear. They even did a study where they had, a, there was a, a study on constipation and that there was different groups and they gave them different amounts of fiber and one group got zero fiber and the group with a zero fiber, 100% cured the constipation. Wow. Well, so, and talk about that, like eating, is there different um, diets for your uh, genetics or whatever? Because uh, I know like Jordan Peterson and his daughter, Michaela Peterson, they do the carnivore or they do, she does this thing called the lion diet, which is even like the next level carnivore diet. Like it's only yeah. land animals. It's super strict, but she got rid of all her autoimmune issues and stuff. So there was a guy at my gym and he was talking about how, oh, he's got, uh, I think the rheumatoid arthritis or some sort of, and he's a young guy. And I was like, oh, have you tried like the carnivore diet? And he goes, oh, well that only works for people of Nordic descent. Cause they're, 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 uh, the Peterson people are, they're from Nordic mm -hmm. descent. He's like, most people it, that diet doesn't work. Do you, do you understand that? You uh, I know. I mean, I understand where he's coming from and it is a theory and I'm not going to say it's completely wrong, but I don't think it's correct. Mm. I, I think that we're all humans. We're all homo sapiens. Okay? And you know, we all came from meat eaters and there was times in history, most of history where we had to rely on just animal foods for maybe most nine months of the year. Mm -hmm. And so we are all kind of different. And yet there's a lot of stuff going on and people have a lot more problems these days. And because there's our toxic environment has, you know, all these things attacking us. So yes, it, things can work differently for different people and there's different predispositions and stuff like that. But uh, I think that any human can eat just animal foods for a period of time and reverse a lot of problems and be fine. But I'm not saying, I, I don't recommend carnivore diets to people. I, you know, I, I, I think it's a modality, right? It's a intervention that you can use. So maybe there, someone could say, well, it's not, it's not good long-term or this didn't work for me because I didn't feel right for the first, you know, but it's like, well, you need to be adapted to it. Like you, going keto, it doesn't feel right. You know, after you stop eating all these carbs, you your body craves them and you you have a, a transition to fat burning and you feel low energy and it's hard to work out. And then you get past it and then it can work. You know, there's all these things that go on with, with these different diets. And, and I don't think people should do them long-term either because people mm -hmm. are like, oh, well, I did it for a year and then I, I started having these problems. I'm like, yeah, we, we don't need to do carnivore forever. But isn't part of the theory too with carnivore is that if you just eat meat, so now you're not eating uh, the processed stuff, which is terrible for you, but also it may be too that even the fruits and vegetables 
can be bad for people, not necessarily because fruits and vegetables are bad, but because of all the stuff, these chemicals that we're spraying, uh, what do you call it, the glyphosate? glyphosate. Yeah, yeah. All these terrible things that are being sprayed on our uh, chemicals or the, our soil. Like, I don't know all the science behind that, but I just know that, you know, whatever, we don't know. I, I mean, I don't know all that, you probably know more than I do about what is being sprayed in our, our food, our fruits and vegetables, and definitely like anything sort of bread or whatever. I know like in... Europe, people who are gluten intolerant go to Europe and they eat the bread and they're fine. So there's some things that chemicals that are being uh, put in our food that are really bad for people. So if they just eat a meat diet and they're just getting literal meat, the meat acts as like a, is filtering a lot of this stuff that that we're eating and, and kind of acts as the middleman. Yeah. Yeah. So all that it, I, I kind of agree with that. So I'm not saying that people need to avoid all the fruits and vegetables, but they could probably have great benefits because they're not getting all of those different chemicals and things. And there's a lot of anti-nutrients just in, like, I don't eat a uh, kale or spinach anymore. There's a lot of oxalates in that. And I had problems. So I drink kale and spinach shakes every day for years back in the day. And that's just not natural. That's not how humans ate. And so I have problems with oxalates. So there, and there's also these leaves are covered in, yeah, in the pesticides and stuff. So if you get rid of those, then you probably will see a lot of improvements. But again, you can also just add back in some organic fruits and certain vegetables, like fermented vegetables, and you won't have these problems. And you can like eat a more normal diet that's sustainable for you, right? Like I don't think people need to go so extreme mm -hmm. with the carnivore. So what are your thoughts? Explain red meat, because that's one that's gone, it's been demonized. And even my dad, he he got cancer. And after he got the cancer, um, this doctor told him to avoid red meat so that, you know, the cancer wouldn't flare back up or whatever. And uh, explain also the, the, the difference between grass fed and corn fed, because that is that make a huge difference? Like is corn fed beef pretty is that bad for you? I mean, I know grass fed is better, but is, is corn fed awful or is it that big of a difference? Uh, it depends on who you ask. So I have I have a whole grass fed and we're finished. Um, finished regenerative meat company. So people will think I would say that you can only eat the grass fed and finished meat, but I actually don't say that because I've, I, I just don't believe in that um, extreme. I feel like there's so many people that can't afford that. And they're, they're gonna, they're gonna do a lot better if they eat normal grocery store meat than any mm. other food out there. And, mm. and I've seen it, I know tons of doctors and people personally that have completely changed their health, reversed chronic disease, uh, chronic conditions and lost even hundreds of pounds eating grocery store meat, regular grass, um, just whatever feedlot, right? Corn fed or it's it's a it's a bunch of it's not just corn, right? It's just it's just all kinds of things. Completely changed their entire life just by eating meat from the grocery store. So there there's no problem with it. There might be uh, well, no, there is definitely benefits to eating the grass fed and finished stuff, right? There is a, a whole host of uh, secondary compounds that are in them is a better fat profile, mm. right? It has more um, omega threes compared to omega sixes, which is there's a, there's a lot going on, but it's just not required, mm. right? So meat, yeah, thinking that meat causes cancer is the biggest lie, right? My my series is called Food Lies, and my Instagram is Food Lies. The biggest lie is that meat is bad for us. It makes no sense. It's I think it's a big propaganda tool that keeps the status quo, that keeps the food industries in business, right? That keeps this whole system the way it is, is they have to have an enemy, right? So the, the enemy has been animal fat, saturated fat, and red meat since Ansel Keys, really. Hmm. That's around the 1950s when that all started. Before that, for all of history, and even around the world, people who, who don't buy into the guidelines still know this, that meat and animal fat we're the healthiest foods we can eat, the most nutrient dense and bioavailable nutrition we can get, and the most prized foods that we've always eaten. And then they they needed to blame an enemy, so they it was a good one because if meat and fat are bad, then you have to eat. Then all the other you know low fat products are good, right? Mm -hmm. Then they can just sell cheap corn, wheat, and soy, bread, pasta, the whole food pyramid. It's just it's just all a big racket, really, and. You, people have to realize that like it, it's actually incomprehensible that eating meat would be bad for us, right? Any food, any species on earth, any animal eats a diet that 
from their environment, right? It, it's just a, a koala bear eats the leaves, you know, the, the lion eats the zebra, the zebra eats the grass. Like this is just how animals live. And it's, this is why they're healthy. It's that the diet that they evolved on is what they're made for. And so it makes no sense that red meat would be the problem. You have to realize what came into the diet, what changed, right? Like what changed with the disease? came in and it was of course all the processed foods and unnatural oils and added sugars and just yeah mm -hmm. refined foods well then what about uh the eggs because th they've gone back and forth with this I and mean, they've said don't eat eggs no eggs are good no just the egg whites don't eat the yolks now they're saying the yolks have uh choline and i mean even the people at my uh gym are recommending they they tell me to eat only egg whites and they're like well you can throw like one egg in like with like six egg whites so talk about the eggs and eggs, egg whites versus full uh -huh. eggs and pasture raised versus uh cage free and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, eggs are a good example of why, you know, everything's bogus as well. All these people trying to say that eggs are bad. It's the perfect food. It's actually one of the most perfect foods that humans can eat. It's a whole chicken, right? It, it has all of the vitamins and minerals and protein that can create an entire living chicken. And we can eat that and get all of that nutrition. So the yolk is where all the, the good nutrients are. And it's also where the cholesterol is. So that's the kind of propaganda because we thought that you could just you would just eat cholesterol and then you'd get high cholesterol and then you just get heart disease. That was the narrative. And really there's studies that keep coming out every year that show that's not true. I just posted mm -hmm. about one recently. There was a big study that just showed people who ate this amount of eggs had no risk for heart disease, no increased cholesterol. There's nothing wrong with it. So it it's kind of this old myth that won't die. And in the in the bodybuilding community and the workout world, I kind of get where they're coming from. I mean, it's wrong, but I get that the thought process is but to build muscle and lose fat, right? To get ripped, you want to eat a lot of protein and you want to cut down on carbs and fat or you know either uh, both of them really you, some people go low carb some people go low fat some people go both if you're a bodybuilder and you're trying to get good on stage for competition you're going to go very very high protein probably very low fat and like lowish carb too right you you still you know you still need some energy right to like get through the day and do your yeah. workouts but this is like a bodybuilding getting ripped diet is tons and tons of protein and lower on the fats and carbs. So that's just a short-term hack to lose fat and maintain your muscle, right? But that that doesn't mean that it's the most nutritious and it's most long-term health promoting thing you can mm. do, right? So I get it because the yolk has more fat in it and the egg white is just pure protein mainly. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to lean out temporarily, you could probably get more lean by eating tons of egg whites and maybe only one yolk and, you know, eating lots of eggs and meat or, uh, you know, meat and fish and other things and cutting down on fat and cutting down some carbs too. That doesn't mean it's long-term health. Like really long-term health is about full, complete protein, complete vitamins and mineral profile. And that would be where you'd eat the whole egg. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. So that makes sense. Cause I think my, my gym even, they tell me that they're like, we, we just want to make you look good. So even yeah, the I mean, it's short term. they do, they, they do exercises that, that, uh, you know, try to grow the muscles that make you look buff and all that stuff. So yeah, that makes sense. That's what oh, people want. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a short term result. It's hard to think long term, right? Because it's not like I'm like counting, like I just have these immediate benefits of eating the egg yolks, mm -hmm. but there are benefits that are in the couple of years. I don't get sick anymore. I don't, you know, like all these things that uh, you can tell that your immune system's working well. Like, you know, there's there's way more things that happen from eating the full nutrient profile that you're not going to see just by trying to get shredded in six months. Right. What about talk about um, organic foods versus GMO, non-organic, and then now I think there's a new thing, bioengineered, which scares the hell out of me. And I know that they, um, I think it was in like. I don't know when, what year it was. It was during Obama's administration, which kind of shocked me. They approved this dark act thing. So they don't have to tell us what is GMO and what is not. So you, I mean, you just assume if it doesn't say non GMO or then you assume that it is GMO, right? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, this is just another one of those things that the food industry uh, just keep doing to make more money. And the government kind of supports too, because like I said, what's good for the top isn't necessarily good for the bottom. And it's like they they kind of make decisions on a world level or on a nationwide level. They're like, well, people need to get fed, right? So they're like, well, there's this new technology that will genetically modify things and make the wheat grow bigger and faster. And they're, and they're like, okay, this sounds great. We can help feed more people. But they don't realize the repercussions of that. You know, and it's like, so yes, we do have GMO wheat and it is way bigger and taller and grows faster. And that's the theory of why when you go to Europe, you don't, people who normally can't eat bread can eat bread in Europe or pasta because they don't have this GMO, gigantic hybridized wheat also covered in glyphosate, right? They have the more ancient varieties, right? It's like the heirloom variety or, you know, and, it, and it's not as profitable, right? It's just, a, it's a little bit less profitable and the, it doesn't have as big a yield, but they do it traditionally and it works and they, you know, they grind it fresh and into flour and they make it and it, you know, theoretically, that's why they can eat it and they're not uh, as sick as us. So yeah, I don't, I don't think that you can ever cheat nature. So GMO, all this stuff, pesticides, all of these things that we're doing, they have higher yields and they make more money, but you cannot cheat nature in that it's not, it's going to have a repercussion, right? It's not going to be as good for you. It's going to have these slow problems to human health. Like really, if you want to think about anything that almost can't be debunked is you have to align with nature. You can't cheat it, right? You, you have to just go. If, if someone says, okay, is this food good? And then you say, okay, well, when did we invent this food? <laughs> and and if it's if it's something old that your grandparents ate, or even better that our ancestors ate, it's probably good. And if it's some new genetically modified version, it's probably not as good. And it's just simple. Yeah. Well, then what about alcohol? Because alcohol has been around a while. I think even the Egyptians drank beer, and they used to say, oh, a glass of red wine is good for you. It's good for your heart. Now they're saying. I think the newest thing is al no alcohol mm -hmm. or minimal alcohol. I mean, I don't know. That's another one. It's almost as bad as the egg thing where they just keep going oh, yeah. back and forth, whether it's good or bad. For it's back and forth. Okay. There, there's nothing good about alcohol other than if you have fun. They're the only good thing is if you have... Uh... <laughs> I do like having fun. Okay, so this is the thing. The truth is alcohol is bad. It's basically a poison to your body. And... It, it's not good to drink it every day at all. Even if it's just two glasses of wine per day, I, I, that is not good. And you know, there's scientists like Dr. Huberman's just completely talking about this, but like no alcohol is better than having alcohol, even if it's in moderation. But we have been drinking alcohol for so much of history. We've been brewing things, fermenting things. I went to Tanzania, they were brewing banana beer and they would they'd ferment bananas and they would put in uh, actually this, what is it? The bark of a tree that prevents parasites. Hmm. Uh, I forget what it's called. But so they they naturally knew this that they uh, wormwood. They would put wormwood into the the banana beer, and it would help cleanse them. They hmm. would only drink it once a week. They would have fun. It was a social occasion, and it and it can be fun, right? So there's a re, there's a, there's negative sides to everything, right? There, like anything could be bad for you. Right. So with the alcohol thing, it's better to have none, but if you're going to like ancestrally, I think if you look at human history, there, there always was this desire to be social, have fun, laugh. And it, this happens not often, right? This was like a special occasion and people and, and yeah, you can bounce back from anything. So I guess I'm trying to uh, yeah. give the nuanced view of this and, and not like completely scare people away from it. It's, it's better to not drink, mm -hmm. but if you're going to like have a little bit on occasion, I think it, it could could provide you some benefit of, say, having a great time on a special occasion. But also, some people just be like, hey, I don't need the alcohol to have a good time and good for them. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Well, what about, um, and here's another one that I hear goes back and forth a lot. Good, bad for you. Coffee. Is coffee okay? And also, like, I think... Talk about the different kinds of coffee because isn't like there's like chemicals sprayed on coffee. I heard there's like mold on coffee now. Oh man, it's like yeah, there's so much going on there. Coffee, yeah, there's like the mycotoxin thing. Like it's better to have like a clean tested coffee. 
could get kind of expensive. Uh, I I'm doing experiments stopping coffee, except I I have a little bit. Um, well, I just were trying to finish my bag actually. <laughs> so I do. I don't think it, it's the end of the world, but I think there's kind of harms in being reliant on anything or having too much of anything every day, right? If you're just like, okay, well, I have three or four cups of coffee every day and that's year round, yeah, that's going to add up, a lot. right? And then also the caffeine, you could be going up and down. You could be like hurting your sleep. You could be relying on stuff, on something to get by. You could be increasing your cortisol in the mornings too much. So again, a lot of nuance there. I started drinking like matcha tea and less of it, right? So it has way less caffeine. So I'd make this thing with raw milk and matcha and a little bit of maple syrup. It tastes delicious. It's kind of like melted ice cream. It look If you go to a sushi restaurant and get the green tea ice cream, it tastes like that. I'm like, well, this is great. And, it, and so again, there's always nuances. There's always risks with everything. And... I, I'm always kind of in the middle on these views of like telling people that you, you don't want to become a monk and sit there and never do anything, you know, and you, you get people get so scared of all foods and then they're like, I have to, I can never go to a restaurant again. I can never have a sip of alcohol again. I can never have any coffee. And it kind of can turn, it can turn into a downward spiral. It can become more stressful than than just drinking the coffee. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah, buy organic coffee. Absolutely. Especially because it's concentrated. So if you're eating something that's concentrated, like if you take a whole bunch of beans and you grind them up and they're covered in pesticides and you grind them up and then put hot water in them and get a concentrated brew, you don't want chemicals on that. You don't yeah. want pesticide residue all over that. Cause it's, yeah. so yes, definitely get some organic coffee but then, and try to drink less of it and try to not be reliant on it. Okay. Yeah. We're at about an hour. Is it okay if we go a little over that? Cause I still got a few more questions. Yeah. Let's do a couple more. This is okay. good. It's like rapid fire. Just getting all the. Yeah. Man. I was just want to, yeah. Cause this is like mostly for my own. Uh, benefit. <laughs> so hopefully other people understand too. But the other thing I want to ask you about protein powders, cause I think I can't remember if it was you or someone else had posted about that. Uh, you know, that used to be the big thing, especially at my gym. They're like, oh, you got to have two protein shakes a day. And, and, but now I'm hearing protein powders are not natural. And there's like a lot of like, what was it lead or all these chemicals in the protein powders because of the machines. And what are your, th what are your thoughts on protein powders and protein shakes? Yeah. Good one. Also one of these nuanced things that maybe people aren't going to like my answer, but protein powder, again, I totally understand the gym people because Getting more protein in your diet is going to help you. It's going to help you burn muscle. I build muscle. It could help you burn fat. But it will help with your satiety. right? So this is a concept I really like that I haven't brought up yet is that everyone wants to eat less, yet it seems like they can't. right? The people are overweight because they ate too much. And it's not, they didn't eat too much protein. I'll tell you that. It's what they ate is too much refined carbs or refined fats, right? It's from the processed food. This is the, your, your, your fats and carbs. So eating well, drinking protein shakes could be helpful to get more protein in your diet, be more full and eat less carbs or fats. I group carbs and fats as, as energy, right? I split things up into nutrients versus energy. So your nutrients are protein, vitamins, and minerals. Your energy is fat and carbs, right? So you kind of think of those in two different buckets. And how to how to gain muscle and lose fat is you eat more nutrients and less energy, right? This is every bodybuilder knows this, and this is exactly what they're telling you at your gym. But the nuance behind it is you want full, you want more nutrients, not just the protein, right? That's why we're talking about eating the whole egg. Mm -hmm. And we want less energy. And how do you do that? is you need to eat foods in their whole form because this is where the satiety aspect comes in. So if you're eating a whole apple, you're getting, I don't know, like 10 grams of sugar, we'll call it, whatever size of apple that is. Okay, you're getting, so you're eating the fiber and the fiber is fine. I'm, you know, there's nothing magical about it. It's just filling up your stomach and it, it's, you're just getting it in the whole food matrix. It doesn't hit your bloodstream as fast. If you drink apple juice, it goes straight into your bloodstream, right? Causes an insulin spike, big glucose spike. And you're not very full from that. You're not, no one's like, oh man, I drank some apple juice eight hours ago. I'm, I'm stuffed. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's like, but if you ate like a bunch of meat and a bunch of apples, you, you will be stuffed mm -hmm. for, 
for five hours, right? Whatever between meals. Like I don't snack. I, I'm eating a bunch of meat and I, I, I do eat apples for dessert, right? Like I can eat two apples, like one apple is enough, you know? You can eat two apples. You are full. So it's you're getting only, say, we call it 10 grams of sugar in that apple, but I'm getting the fiber with it, mm -hmm. right? And I'm full and it's in its whole form. And, I, and I'm full and I'm not going to overeat. If you drink, you can drink a couple apple juice. That could be like six apples. You get 60 grams of sugar per se, right? Like right. whatever size of cup that is. It's, and a, it's as much uh, sugar as soda, right? Or simple. It's like a full soda. Yeah. So you can drink a full soda's worth of apple juice in two seconds. And you're not, you're not getting full from that. Yeah. Right. So the opposite, if you're trying to build muscle, right, you want to get on a bodybuilding, not, not everyone wants to get on a bodybuilding stage, but you know, this is the message at your gym is you don't want to be drinking apple juice. That's the worst thing you could do. You're just getting a whole, but same thing. They're telling you to eat less fat. If you're just dumping butter on everything, that's not going to be great either. Mm -hmm. So these are like refined sources of energy. Really, you just want to eat foods in their whole form, it, get enough protein and nutrients, and try to cut down on the energy side of your equation, whether that's fats or carbs. And that's just like when you zoom out, I, in the beginning, I talked about changing my views and not being biased or dogmatic about diets. And so it's like the farther you zoom out, the more you realize there could be a lot of diets that are good, like the Mediterranean diet could be good, or the I call it the sapien or sapien diet, which is what I do, or generally like a paleo diet. These are all good diets. And what they're doing is giving you enough nutrients, get enough protein, vitamins, minerals for less energy, right? Without all the excess refined carbs and fats. So yeah. it's it, that's like the truth, right? That you can just zoom out and any that's why the sapien it's not like there is one diet it's just a framework that involves animal foods and and real foods on the side yeah and what are your thoughts on um another kind of a trendy thing that people talk about a lot is the intermittent fasting that either like they'll fast for they only eat during an eight hour window and they fast every day for 16 hours or uh they'll do like a day of fasting one day a week or one day a month or several days a month and then you know there's different kinds of fasting i guess because there's just water only there's bone broth fast there's a juice fast what are your thoughts on fasting yeah another great tool so this is again where people get lost in this because it's complicated right and not that now that i know everything about nutrition but i've been studying it long enough to like kind of see through all the different things and it's like fasting is an amazing tool and i used it for years and if you are overweight it is a great tool, okay? But that doesn't mean you have to do it forever, and that doesn't mean you have to get obsessed with it. And you can do different versions of it, and it, it doesn't matter. You just have to find out which one works for you. But I still don't really eat for 16 hours a day. I, I still am kind of just only eating in an eight-hour window just because I'm not hungry. Like, I haven't eaten yet today. Like, I eat at noon, 1 p.m. That's when I get hungry. And then I'll eat dinner, and I eat big meals, and then I don't eat, right? I don't snack. I'm only eating for eight hours a day and it's amazing. And that helped me lose a lot of body fat, get more muscle, you know, heal my metabolism. Everything about my life got better by eating the correct foods and then eating less often. But that doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. Right now, in the past couple of years, after I fixed my metabolism and I got to my ideal body composition, right? I got to my goal. Then, so people out there, you can get to your goal weight and then you don't have to do the insane strict things anymore because you're in a good place. And then I can be adding more fruit and sweet potatoes into my diet is what I did. I could be eating breakfast now if I want to. And it, it, it's not, it's not going to affect me negatively. Mm -hmm. it, you know what I mean? Like I can, yeah. I can, I can still use these tactics and techniques, right? If I, if I go off track or something, I go on a trip, then yeah, maybe you can use these techniques like fasting and it'll help you. And, and there's also the autophagy, right? So people talk about these benefits of doing the fasting to clear out your cells. And this is like, good. And yeah, absolutely. But you, but then some people go too far and then they're obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And so then what about, um, so yeah, well, do you, so do you ever do, you said you only eat out like every three months or something. So do you still do like a cheat meal or something? Or is it like you make something at home? Like hand, mm. you, know, uh, you cook it yourself is kind of your cheat meal or like, I mean, it yeah. seems amazing that I would love to get to that point where I'm only eating in a restaurant once every three uh, months, but like, it seems like 
I would still occasionally want like a cinnamon roll or a slice of pizza or something like occasionally. You, no, you're right. So I, I do help some people around Austin, some friends. I don't really do like health coaching publicly, but this is the number one thing that people need to, to learn and, and learn how to do. Cause I had the same thing. Yes. So I was doing cheat meals for many years, right? I had this whole journey. Like I said, it was like a 10 year process to get to this. And I think it's, it's, it's perfectly okay to, there's human nature to want to indulge once in a while. And so I was doing that years ago and I would eat clean. And then on Sundays I would do a cheat meal. It's what the rock does. He, I think, I don't know that much about him, but I just know he eats insane cheat meals. Right. And goes like wild on Sundays. And then he's like really strict otherwise. Okay. And you know, I mean, that's not what Tom Brady, even he talks about the 80, 20 rule that 80% of what he eats is really healthy and 20%, which is like, that seems like extreme. That that seems like a a lenient to me. I would think that he would be like 85% or something. Yeah. I'm more like 85, 10. I mean, not so. Okay. Oh yeah. There, there's different ways to do it too. It's not like I'm hundred percent perfect. So even if I'm not going to restaurants, I go to a lot of a food events and there's like at people's houses. Right. And these are like where people prepare foods. And, and I, I'm more like a cheat meal for me would be going to a potluck or some kind of barbecue and then having just foods that people made and not freaking out about it. Hmm. So yeah, I'm not perfect. And And I think, yeah, the Tom Brady thing that that's, that is a good rule is that you can do very well just doing like kind of an 80, 20 rule of like eating clean as much as you can, and then dipping into some other foods, uh, when necessary. But what I was going to say about the health coach or just helping people with their diet is there is this human nature to want to indulge. And I still have that, but instead of going out to eat and like a lot of people that they have problems with DoorDash or Uber Eats or whatever, and they're just like. I just want to order everything under the sun and just go nuts. Instead, I teach people and I do this myself is find kind of cheat meals, quote, cheat meals that you make for yourself that are very indulgent, Mm. but that aren't bad for you. So I can have a stack. I have like this thing of grass fed burger patties from Costco. You can get a, a stack of these frozen burger patties. This is like my backup plan, like thing in my freezer. If I, want an indulgent meal and i do once a week i will i could cook up like a stack of patties you know a couple patties with cheese grill up onions you can have some bacon you have like jalapenos and like pickles on the side like it's this huge pile of food it's like very indulgent right so delicious i mean i I just don't have the bun or i don't have the french fries you know what i mean i just cook like a really indulgent meal that's just real foods and it tastes delicious. Does, does that make sense? Like, yeah, fine. So that's it. your cheat meal is kind of like a, like a, a what, what, it in an out burger, they call it like the flying Dutchman. You could just get the flying. Yeah. 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 That's do the, that. Or even go to in and out and get a flying Dutchman. Yeah. That's There's a, nothing that wrong. I mean, in and out uses pretty fresh and good ingredients. You could just get a stack. Yeah. You could get like, you can tell it because when you get the flying Dutchman, it's just meat and cheese. They don't hide it with the bun and the ketchup and you can take, and it's like, wow, this is really good. I actually like it better. It's great. Or you could get it the other way with like protein style with like the lettuce, you know, wrapped and you eat. I mean, yeah, absolutely. There's ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. All good stuff. Um, I guess, yeah. One more thing. Uh, last, probably, I guess I'll make this the last question. Uh, what are your thoughts? This is kind of a weird little, I mean, it's been labeled a conspiracy, but I don't think it is, is uh, the bugs in our food. Have you heard of this thing? They're starting to try to put bugs in our food and they're, oh. They're grounding up crickets and stuff and, and then calling it like they have some scientific name. So they have to like read the label. And this is a real thing though, right? I, yes, I've read about it. And I saw a post just yesterday that there was, there was some sort of political thing. It's like Democrats, you know, hiding a bill that says that they could put in bugs in our food, you know, some sort of political thing. No, no, th- this is real. This There's like kind of an agenda uh, that is getting people used to different sources of protein so whether that be lab grown meat or just plant-based meat burgers or insect protein and it's kind of under the guise of environmental sustainability and i am all for you know having a clean environment but i think it's been co-opted to push agendas and change the way people eat and i think there's a lot of money involved and a lot of power 
involved, right? They even do this with the CO2. There's like, oh, there's like carbon credits and there's this and that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I, we don't, we shouldn't just be like burning. I don't want like, I don't want to live next to a coal plant, right? I don't want like burning right. coal in my air, but I also don't believe that the cows burping are causing climate change. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, this I had is an expert on my show all about this and I watched your movie on your channel, the climate, the movie mm -hmm. where you interview, uh, I, I don't know. Did you produce? It wasn't mine. I just reposted it because I got permission. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it, the yeah. film they YouTube took it down off the original filmmakers oh. page. They censored it. And so, you know, Really? I, oh yeah. So, they were allowing oh. other people to post it cuz they knew oh. that was going to happen. And so, mine has the most views right now. You can't even search it. So, they also shadow banned. So, wow. they haven't removed it from my account yet, but you cannot search it. Every comment I get, I I check my YouTube a lot and they're just like couldn't find this. It was blocked. So That's you have to go crazy. To I mean, I watched it. It's so professionally done. And, and the people you interviewed are like Harvard and uh, Stan. I mean, there was all these like really well-known. Oh, I didn't interview. One, or sorry. Sorry. Yeah. But the, yeah, yeah. The, the people that were interviewed. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one guy was Obama's science advisor. Oh, yeah. They have the ex guy that started Greenpeace. Yeah. Too. The co-founder of Greenpeace. Yeah. Yep. No, no, it's it's a yes. great thing. Yeah. You got to go to, go to the my Food Lies YouTube channel and you, you got to find yeah. it. It's It's hard to find. But this, yes, I'm all about the 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 narratives are so extreme. They right. they want to keep pushing these narratives, and it's really money, power, control, all this stuff. And it makes sense as they push this agenda, and it always has this kind of outcome of, well, it's for the greater good, but you have to eat bugs, or oh, yeah. like big corporations can use the, like these these climate credits, and then they're just buying and selling climate credits and right. cheating the system. And it always seems to benefit these different uh, people on the top. Yeah, and, you can go down the rabbit hole, and uh, you could you know World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and all these nutcases that uh, I mean, but they, they'll they'll t say these things out straight up, you know. Straight up, say you know you're gonna eat bugs, you're gonna not drive a car, you're gonna be happy for this, and oh nothing. And they flat and be out happy. say it. So yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I'm in, I'm into all this stuff. I I try not to talk about it too much because I don't want to be censored. But it's right. yeah, I think yeah. it's it's completely true, and it it goes along with my thing of like what's good for them is bad for us, right? Exactly. The oh nothing and be happy. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean I've been posting about that for years. They took yeah. down that video, but it's. That's the, you think it's all good. They make it sound good. They're like you won't even have to own a car. It'll just come pick you up in the future and this and that. And then you're like, oh, this is okay. If you, but they're you know, going to own stuff. They're going to own it all. A jet. They're going to exactly. eat, eat. And it's, it's they, what, you know, but it's different rules for you. Yeah. It's kind of scary stuff. So yeah. yeah, I love what you're doing. Your, your page is great. Uh, people should follow you on Instagram. It's food lies and the docu series will hopefully be coming out soon. And uh, right now they can still watch your uh, Game Changers debunked film on YouTube, The Climate, which is, I guess, it's not yours, but you have it posted on your channel. Mm -hmm. And then yep. um, nosetotail.org is all your uh, products and your and uh, uh, you sell the steaks and like the beef tallow and stuff like that, right? Yeah, we do beef tallow body care. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have meat, we have a lot of good pasture-raised pork and uh, yeah, just good products that, um, you, yeah, you want to put real fat on your skin. Uh, you don't want to put chemical stuff. Your, your body soaks up whatever you put on it so yeah. yeah that's why we made this beef tallow body care stuff amazing great stuff i love the work you're doing and um thank you so much for coming on the show it's very educational all right good times thanks man. all right thanks brian i'll see you later